Hello everybody, this is another episode of Cosmic Echo, a Tale Leaders podcast. My name's Lee Adams and I'm the host today. And I'm speaking with Jade Shaw, who is a teacher and guide for out-of-body experiences, uh, astral projection, lucid dreaming, and more. Um, in this conversation, we talk about some techniques to have lucid dreams, as well as um, some te- techniques to deal with fear-induced dreams, um, sleep paralysis, things like that. But we uh, we try to keep it positive and talk about the uh, the positives of lucid dreaming and what kind of experiences you can have as well as uh, kind of just some overview of how to have those experiences and some more interesting information about Jade Shaw and her uh, her past work. So without further ado, let's get to the interview. Jade, thanks for um, being on the show with me today and um, just want to um, find out more information about yourself and what you do and uh, how you got interested in um, lucid dreaming and out-of-body out experiences and um, how that all came about and you know inspired you to continue doing this, um, this research and this uh, practice that you have. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me on the podcast. It's great to be chatting with you and about these topics, which are my favorite in the world. Um, So yes, I'm an out-of-body experience researcher and teacher. I'm in my last four months of my master's degree, which is a degree in transpersonal psychology. So the study of consciousness, spirituality, and psychology, and kind of the correlation between the three. Um, For my thesis, I'm looking at the transformative effects of the out-of-body experience. Mm. So what that means is after we've had one, how does it impact our life in any way, such as our values, our beliefs, our identity, and does it kind of shift our life trajectory? And if so, is that in a very subtle way or is it in a significant way? So I'm looking at kind of tracking how that might impact our life, if at all, at the moment. Um, But... I got into our body experiences really through about a 10 year practice of lucid dreaming. Mm. So I'd heard of lucid dreaming and I'd been practicing it for a while. And then I came across dream yoga, which is a set of practices from Tibetan Buddhism. And it talked about our body experiences. And I did a bit of reading and I thought, oh, wow, this sounds amazing. Is it possible? I don't know if this is real. And to be honest, I thought it sounds a little bit like lucid dreaming. Is there actually a difference or is it just people thinking they're out of body, but actually they're having a dream? And um, and so I had a big experience in 2014, a very powerful out of body experience, uh, which effectively was the seed and the tipping point to changing my career and changing my life, really. Mm. I think it, it all started when I was really little. So when I was a child, I was really petrified of the nighttime. I actually had to sleep in a sleeping bag with the landing light on for years, like well into my teens. And this is because it often felt like someone had kind of grabbed the end of my bed and was shaking it back and forth. Hmm. I'd hear like unusual sounds and occasionally seem to see through my eyelids. It was like straight up scary stuff. And so around age 10, I got really fed up. And I wanted it to end. And even my mother thought about taking me to see a child therapist because it was having that much of an impact on my life. Um, But then one night, I realized if I slowed my breathing right down, it would kind of tame the experience and bring it to a stop. So that's what I started to do. And the experiences subsided. Didn't think much more of it. Hmm. But then fast forward to my late 20s and I met my husband and I run my own dance company. I don't sleep with the light on anymore. (laughs) And then I pick up Robert Monroe's book, Journeys Out of the Body. And I think, oh my God, this sounds a lot like what I experienced as a child. So he talks about the vibrational state, these feelings of shaking, unusual sounds and visual perceptions, uh, which occur when someone apparently leaves the body. And I thought, if I had allowed this vibrational state to continue as a child, would I have been able to have an out-of-body experience? So I really felt drawn to unravel my childhood experiences. And after some more research, I thought, okay, let's give this a go. Let's see if it's possible. Um, So I gave it a go and it didn't happen. So I tried again and it still didn't happen. 
And I thought, oh, God, I couldn't get rid of this when I was a child, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and now it won't happen again. So after a month of trying, I got a bit impatient. I know it was only a month, but hey ho. Uh, and I actually gave up. But then one night, I got up to go to the loo, and then when I got back in bed, I dropped straight into the vibrational state. Mm. So I was awake, and I knew that if I were to do an exit technique, which I'd read about these different ways to potentially leave the physical body, I might be able to have an out-body experience. Um, and a little side note here, um, some maybe of the listeners might know already, there's different ways we can exit the body. We mm. might float out, sink through the back, phase out, and kind of shift out sideways and that's the one that I did so I'm, I moved out of my physical body and I rolled out kind of to the side and for me the first time this was the powerful experience that kind of changed the course of my life um, it felt like you know when you get glue on your hands as a kid and you peel it off your fingers oh yeah so it felt like that sensation um, but kind of peeling away from my whole body so mm. detaching a bit like velcro and I, I was out of my physical body and I thought, okay, I'm in my room, my body's on the bed, Sh I should go do something, right? So I fly out the window and I drop down into the street and it's, it's early morning and I remember with crystal clear clarity, kind of the dew on the grass and the sunlight beaming down. And as I looked down at where I thought my physical body would be, I, I actually looked like the invisible woman. I was translucent and had kind of a sort of energy body. Hmm. And when I moved my arm from one place to another, it was a little bit like, you know, when a light leaves a trail behind. Yeah. And it, um, it, it looked like that. And I do remember thinking, oh, my God, this is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't want to get overexcited in case I shot back to my physical body um, from being over-emotional. Um, so then I thought, well, I'm still here, right? So I should verify this experience. So I went to find a door number that I could evidence when I got back from the journey to my physical body. So I traveled down the street and I came to some crossroads and there was a house on the right with a green door that was arched and it said number 18. And I thought, okay, I'm going to remember this because it's on the crossroads, it's, it's to the side. I really rem I'll really remember it. But what do I do now? I was still out of body. So this was quite a long experience, especially compared to other ones that I've had. And I don't know why I said this at the time, but it just came out of my mouth. And in my head, in the experience, I was kind of stood arms open, if I would have had a physical body. <laughs> and I yelled out, take me to Nirvana. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, oh my God. Um, and so I started to float upwards and it was the first time in the experience that I, it was out of my control hmm. and it was like an unseen force had lifted me up 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 above the trees but before I could reach the clouds I passed through some sort of thin membrane or it felt like a flat sheet of static hmm. um, and when I came through and broke the surface between this how can I explain it? it? It felt like slowly rising out of water, like moving from one atmosphere to another. And when I passed through, I'd lost any sense of my energy body or shape or form. And I was just a point of awareness or point of perception. Hmm. I found myself in a huge, massive tunnel that filled the entirety of my perception. So there was no up, down, left, right, no sense of space. And there was a bright white light at the end of the tunnel. And it's really far away. And I start floating towards it. And I get about halfway. And for the first time in the experience, I started to get scared. What happened when I felt fear? Back in my physical body. <laughs> So I sit up, waking, I wake with a ball, I sit up straight away, um, my husband wakes up, and he's yelling, what's happened, what's happened? I turn to him and I say, I think I've just had an out-of-body experience. And then he goes, oh, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> and then, no. Um, and I was like, no, you don't understand, I came out of my physical body. I'd had this big experience, um, but he's had them before, so it, you know, it wasn't such a big deal to him. Yeah. 
But that same day, I went back to the house on the corner to check to see if it was the same door number, and it was number 18, which hmm. was the same one that I had in my experience. And I looked at the tunnel of light, and, you know, as you know, other people had seen it too in out-of-body experiences. Um, so, yeah, that was that was a, a big uh, change maker for me. And I think the biggest thing I took from it um, was something that a lot of people with out-of-body experience tend to report, which is when they see themselves outside of their physical body for the first time. And not everybody has this, but for me, when I'd self-identified with my physical body for my entire life, it made me realize that we are not just the physical body, which is beautiful and a miracle and is, is such a healer in itself but that there's something also wonderfully mysterious going on behind the scenes of our everyday reality. And connecting to that, for me, particularly in times of difficulty, has filled me with such reassurance and peace and courage, really. And that's what allowed me to effectively leave my own dance company. Um, it was in the height of its success, and we were about to actually receive a big investment for a three-year project. Oh, wow. But I, yeah, and I, I couldn't go on doing the same work, knowing what I knew now from my experience. So I took the decision to leave, and I had a fantastic team, and they were all very supportive. Um, yeah, to explore our body experiences further and um, find out really, you know, what is this phenomenon that happens to people all over the world? And that's why I decided to do my master's degree. And wow. I kind of took the academic route because um, I sort of see myself as kind of a skeptical mystic. Mm, okay. um, I can't help it. I'm from Yorkshire. So for people in America, Yorkshire's um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a kind of, it's a northern, um, uh, it's a northern, why can't I find my place in, in England. Okay. So if you watch Game of Thrones, if you watch Game of Thrones and um, the North, the North is based on Yorkshire, so the oh, people okay. are quite you know, humble, of honour, you know, Jon Snow and all of that. So, But we're quite um, practical, quite to the point, believe it when you see it, sort of folk. I see. Um, not everyone, but um, yeah. So two things you get when you're born in Yorkshire is a love of tea and <laughs> an bullshit radar. Oh, so nice. I was like, I know. So I was like, actually, is what I experience actually yeah. real? Yeah, I mean... Um... I, I would I resonate a lot with what you have to say. Um, I'm very skeptical. I've always been that way, and I started lucid dreaming too, and then I had an out of body experience, and that's kind of what brought me to where I am today. Um, and it it sound um, it sounds like your experience, you know, your first time was pretty dramatic because a lot of people um, tend to leave their body and then quickly kind of come back. So it's kind of interesting. It, maybe your practice in lucid dreaming um, kind of allowed you to explore a little bit longer than typically people do i wonder what your thoughts on that are yeah it is common most people's first few experiences i find it's either one or the other depending on the circumstance if they're trying to self-induce and self-initiate an out-of-body experience it is often kind of a moment of coming out and then a moment of going back in but also it can be either that, or I find it's the extreme, and it tends to be quite quite a powerful experience, quite transformative, or a very big one. And some of the people in my case studies um, have have that as well, where they've, I'm looking at people who have a, a spontaneous one, and it's been quite powerful, mm -hmm. versus the ones that are momentarily. But I definitely think the lucid dreaming practice allowed me to remain out for that for that long. And that's been the longest one that I've had, actually. Interesting. Um, the other ones that I've had haven't been that long. Oh, okay. Um, you said you're a skeptic, too. And so how would you describe these experiences? I mean, lucid dreaming is a lot more common, I think, than out-of-body experiences for people. And they can kind of, they can relate to that. They can be like, oh, I'm, I can become aware in my dreams. But even, you know, if we know from history that there are skeptics on that one until uh, Stephen LeBerg and soon before that, you know, proved it that... uh lucid dreaming is actually something that happens to people um but out of body experiences is a bit more of a jump for a lot of people they're like what is this how can you experience something that's different than a lucid dream you know it's a dream they think it's a dream um just like normal dreams how do you 
um, convey a message to people like that and describe an experience that they haven't had, but um, to kind of put it in a perspective of it being possible? Well, it's a great question. And that's something I'm trying to do at the moment, if <laughs> I'm honest. I'm in the process of trying to actually do that because it is, it's such a big experience and something that if people have never even had, say, a lucid dream or a transpersonal experience beyond themselves, it's very hard to relate to and even comprehend. So I am trying to make it kind of easier for um, people to grasp. Um, I think there's, um, there's something in your question about kind of how they might be able to experience it and how to communicate what it is to them. Yeah. I think with being able to experience it, I, that, I, that's what I say. I say, do the techniques and the practices, and if you commit to them over a, an extended period of time and don't give up after a couple of weeks, <laughs> like I almost did, um, they will have one. You know, um, I always say to people that try, um, try to do it in the workshops, you wouldn't go to a yoga class and expect to do a handstand balance in the first class or go to a piano class and expect to play a concerto it can take some time and i think i think that's i think it's to do with practice and i think it's to work do working out what techniques work for you and also being open to the possibility of having one because we if we approach it with with um cynicism and we and skepticism think oh well it's not going to happen then i think that will that will feed into the possibility of us being able to have one so there's three steps that I that I teach, um, which is a mind awake body asleep state. So uh, people might be familiar with that, which is where the physical body is completely relaxed, but the mind is awake and aware. And then the second part is the vibrational state. So this um, is when we have a lot of visual um, perception, where it might be visual, it might be oral perceptions and a very physical feeling of maybe energy rushing in the body. Um, there's lots of different um, aspects to the vibrational state, but it's how can we bring this vibrational state on, which happens naturally for some people. And then how can we exit the physical body? So there's a number of different ways we can exit. And then if we practice those three, um, we can potentially have an out-of-body experience. And the most common, like you said, is you come up for a few moments and then you go back in. But if we're able to focus our mind and our attention and we have some tools in our box of how to overcome fear as well, because it can be quite scary, particularly the vibrational state. Some people freak out when they first feel it because they don't know what it is. Then, um, then we could have a, a, an out-of-body experience. In regards to communicating what it is, I, I tend to try and keep it very simple and very basic rather than going into the potential of consciousness and theories of reality, which it can hmm. sometimes head that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just in terms of how does it practically feel to have one um, and what do we sense when we're, when we're out of the body and what could those environments possibly be? Um, we touch on them very simply first and at a basic level. And then in the two day workshop, which I run, we go a bit more into depth about exploring the idea of consciousness and nature of reality, which inevitably heads that way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I'm not sure if I've answered your question. Yeah. Well. Um, <laughs> well, I, I'm wondering, um, and I always wonder this and many people do, I think is what is the difference between a lucid dream and an out of body experience? Where does it become an out of body experience and where does, um, the lucid dream end? Great question. I get asked this all the time, <laughs> <laughs> which is good because, you know, I think it's, it's something that needs exploring further. So I can only say, um, what I know from my current experience and, um, some of my research as well. Put very simply, and also arguably, for me, a lucid dream is 99% in your own psychological mind. So you're having a dream, you wake up within the dream state, your unconscious mind, and you go, oh, I'm dreaming. And then we can do lots of fantastic things within the lucid dream and have some control to some extent, but we've never fully got control, I don't think, anyway. And then an out-of-body experience is, when we potentially can shift beyond the confines of our own consciousness and we seem to be able to move beyond 
not only our physical body, but also our own mind stream, potentially tapping into um, a greater awareness, a greater reality, and extending into what some might say cosmic consciousness, this idea of interconnectedness and potentially into subjectiveness as well, beyond the body, with other consciousnesses, beings, um, entities, I'm choosing my words carefully here, <laughs> <laughs> um, because I think some of it is something external and some of it is actually aspects of ourselves. Okay. And uh, yeah, so there needs to be some discernment around that. But a little metaphor that, my, uh, that I always say, talking about you know trying to communicate this quite well, is I see it a bit like two sports. So football and basketball are two different sports, right? Yeah. We know this because we're familiar with both games. So both involve getting a ball into the net within a designated area, but they're played completely differently, held in two different environments under separate rules and are not considered to be the same. So a person who has only ever played football or never played either might mistake them as being the same game. And this mistake would be based on a reductionist viewpoint, which is assumed that the use of the balls and the nets must make it the same sport. Mm. Uh, so how does this relate to out-body experience and lucid dreaming? Well, if people do get confused between the two, it's usually because one of the following things has happened. And this is completely normal. So they've had a lucid dream, and because it feels so real, which it does feel so vividly real, um, that they think it was an out-body experience. Another one is they experience sleep paralysis. So this feeling of our body being completely paralyzed, um, but our mind is kind of woken up. Um, we might see scary hallucinations and elements of dream imagery coming over into our waking state. And people think that's an OBE. And then they might dream of having an out-body experience after reading a book or attending a workshop or watching a film about it. I had a dream of having an OBE the other night, actually, and I was able to discern that that was just a dream because I've had OBEs before. Yeah. So that's really normal, and um, it's just people haven't had enough experiences. But a real obvious point is an OBE can happen when you're not even asleep. So you can be completely wide awake and have an out-of-body experience. Um, so there's three different types of OBEs, at least in the way that I present them. Mm -hmm. So one is self-induced or self-initiated, where we get into an altered state of consciousness. For most people... They often practice in the hypnagogic, which is falling asleep, and the hypnopompic, where we're kind of waking up from sleep. So I use those altered states of awareness. Um, so the self-induced out-of-body experiences. And then another one is a forced out-of-body experience, where we have an accident or some extreme circumstances, um, an anxiety attack might, might shift our consciousness out of our physical body. So it's forced. The closest thing is a near-death experience. That would be um, an easy way to explain that. And then the third one is spontaneous. So we might be deeply relaxed in meditation, or we might be just lying on the bed, and then we find ourselves out of the physical body. Mm. Um, so there are three different types. So we can we can be kind of wide awake and have conscious out of body experiences. Whereas a lucid dream, you're completely asleep, you're in REM, rapid eye movement, and you're having a dream. So lucid dreams only occur when we're sleeping. Um, but some subtle differences, if you want to go a little bit deeper, so some subtle differences is I find recall is often stronger um, than general memory after an out-of-body experience. Um, people report it feeling realer than real. Mm -hmm. And although you can say that about lucid dreams as well, it, um, it's more often in out-of-body experiences. Um, there's also... The hallucinations um, within sleep paralysis, you can kind of, no, oh, actually, I won't go too much into that. It'll send <laughs> it down a route. It'll send it down a different route. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so also the environment in, an, in, a, in a lucid dream is easier to manipulate and to change, I find, than in that woody experience. Uh, I'm able to easily change it to a beach landscape or go through the wall or up into the sky um, quite easily and shift and change things in a lucid dream. Whereas in an out-of-body experience, it seems to be less so of that. Um, there's subtle interaction and influence between the environment. Still being able to pass through walls um, 
um, but even that feels realer. Like the wall feels more malleable and more. Oh, it's so difficult to explain. <laughs> and there's a subtle difference in the perceptions of things in the environment in a lucid dream than in an out of body experience. But I'm going to paradoxically say they can also be quite similar. And I think this is what can make it a bit tricky. And the fact that I believe that we can springboard from the out from the lucid dream state into hmm. an out of body experience because we can springboard into an out of body experience from any altered state, in my current opinion. <laughs> no, that makes sense. <laughs> I def- I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, I definitely used uh, lucid dreams in order to springboard into out of body experiences, and I mean, I've all, always uh, personally, I've always debated with myself, you know, like, um, what, how is an out of body experience different than a lucid dream and the differences in it? And what you said was, um, key on point for what, you know, my personal experiences are and their, my reflections on the differences, the realism, things like that. Um, you're, you're spot on, I think. Oh, and one more thing about the, um, reality check. So the reality check test using lucid dreams to confirm that we are lucid dreaming, for anyone that doesn't know a reality check is you might look at your hand and then look away and look back and the brain can't recreate the same detailed image twice so your hand might break down or do something weird so we call that a reality check um so that's based on um the fact that things break down in the lucid dream state when focused upon and i think for example uh, Stephen Leberge found that 95 percent of cases viewing text for a second time within a lucid dream cause the text to break down, sometimes 75% on the first viewing. But things like this is rarely ever reported in out-of-body experiences. Hmm. experiences. So again, it's the, it's the environment I think is, is different. So that's interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, you mentioned something about your first out-of-body experience where you're kind of getting pulled by an invisible force to, um, to some location. Um, is that I mean, has that happened to you often in your current experiences? Or um, I'm, I guess the question would be, what do, you, what do you currently do in your out-of-body experiences? And what are your kind of like your practice? Um, I'm actually doing research because um, I'm doing my thesis at the moment. So I need to have um, kind of literature research, but also experiential research. So I'm not particularly doing anything kind of far out or perhaps perceived as, um, I don't know, phenomenal. I'm just kind of doing very mundane things like going, oh, okay, um, can I do this in that body experience? Can, how, does, how does my, how do I feel as a, as a being without a physical body in the outer body experience? And how does this manifest and what does this look and feel like? So kind of, kind of very basic things um, I'm doing at the moment which sounds a little bit boring, but it's still fascinating. Uh, in regards to being the force, I have noticed that there's sometimes something that appears to guide or shift or have a connection with me that seems like some sort of greater awareness. And I don't feel like this is is another being or an entity or a consciousness. It feels, it feels even bigger than that. The closest thing I could probably think of is some sort of, some sort of, uh, Higher awareness isn't even the right wording either. And I feel that that sometimes we can have our body experiences, which we go out and we have an intention and a motivation. And or sometimes we can go out and we're taken somewhere or led somewhere, whether that's by strong intuition that is showing up as this unseen force in the dream or whether it's it's something greater, I don't know. Um, But I have had somewhere I've been pulled places um, which I think when I've spoken to people, it can, it can seem very scary, but this is when we start to work with surrendering in the out body state. If we feel, if we feel safe, being able to surrender and go with the experience. Cause I think, I, I do think there's some sort of synchronicity to where we're going and what we're seeing in regards to what's going on in our own consciousness and where we're at in our lives. Mm. That's just a personal thought. No, that makes sense too. Um, definitely resonate with that um so with the um with your experiences what have you found that you can kind of take out of that and put it in your own life or other you know other people can have these experiences and take the experience itself and put it into their own life to kind of improve their waking life as well as their their overall dream life 
Definitely. 100%. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> um, like I say, my first experience, my out-of-body experience, um, changed changed my life and i think a large part of that was because i do not fear death now i have this um kind of inner knowing and sense that when my physical body dies somehow my consciousness or mind stream or essence or spirit or soul whatever we want to name it some part of me that is not solely my physical body will go on in some shape or form what happens i have no idea um but I definitely have um, a lack of fear of death. Dying, oh my God, yes, petrified of dying. You know, I don't want a long, <laughs> painful, slow disease or anything like that. But the moment of death, um, I don't have any fear. And this is interesting, and this is why I think one of the biggest things that people take from their out-of-body experiences, um, unconsciously, often, into their everyday actions, is this sense of... Um, it's lack of fear of death, which then manifests as a habit of fearlessness if they do a practice in their everyday life. So the number one biggest fear is death in the human race. It's actually said that that fear underpins most of the fears. Um, the most commonly reported benefit from out-of-body experience is the realization that when the body dies, we do not die. Whether that's true or not, who knows, but the belief is there for the person. So the person has a lack of fear of death. Their themness, you know, your you-ness um, won't die. That is which is kind of somehow our identity. But what's one of the biggest human fears after death, right? It's the unknown. So avoiding, avoiding the unknown is reflected in things like not going for that new job, turning down that day, staying in our comfort zone, um, not being seen and heard in our business or not trying something new. So when we have our body experiences, we are consistently going out into the unknown and being present with whatever we come into contact with. Um, so if there's any control freaks um, that are listening, um, and I raise my hand at this as well, because I'm a Virgo and a control freak, it's like our worst nightmare, right? But we can't control life, you know? Yeah. So through, through this practice, we are plowing that neural pathway in our brain of embracing the unknown, embracing the unknown, embracing the unknown. And that starts to build more of a habit of fearlessness that falls over into our lives. So I think that's one of the most organic, unconscious benefits that people can take from having an out-body experience on its own or a practice. But two of the other ones that I say are uh, very powerful for people in regards to impacting their life and influencing uh, the way that um, they live is connecting or potentially connecting with people who have passed on. So people have reported communicating with loved ones. And as you can imagine, this could be quite healing. Um, what they are communicating with, who knows? Maybe it's just a projection of their own minds or maybe it is the spirit of their loved one. Either way, the healing there remains. Mm. So I want to share a little story about this. There was a young guy who came to the Lucid Dream Forum, which my husband runs, which is monthly in London. And he came and he said, can I talk to someone about my out-body experience? Um, so he got sent to me and I said, let's have a chat, let's sit down. And he said his mother had died mm. and he wanted to self-initiate an out-of-body experience to meet her. And he gave it a go and again, he tried a few times and it hadn't worked. And then one night he was able to sit up out of his physical body. And before he'd even been able to decide to do anything, he said he felt a presence at the end of the room um, towards his side. And it came closer to him and he couldn't quite perceive what it was. He was having struggle perceiving as sometimes we do. There's a, a lack of clarity in some out of body experiences. Um, so he wasn't sure at first what kind of, um, whether it, he should feel threatened and it came closer and he realized it was his mother and she sat next to him on the bed and put her what might be an energetic hand or some sense of herself onto his hand. Um, and he said, you know what? He said, that's all I needed to know hmm. that thing is going to be okay. And it was a short experience, but he came away from that and felt um, it really helped him with his grief. And he was able to get some closure from her death. 
and he had um, what what we call kind of an innate knowing. So it was more than a hunch or a belief or an expectation, but this profound inner knowing that it was some sort of sense of his mother. And I think those sorts of experiences for people dealing with grief can be um, very healing. But I don't want to say that in a way so everyone starts the practice <laughs> and then to connect with someone who's passed on because it's not that easy. And I do think there's a time and a place um, to have that connection. So, um, yeah, that's very powerful. And the last one is um, psychological and spiritual growth. I think this is the most common. And I get every time I have an experience, I have this impact in some sort of way. And so people can ha often have numinous or what we call peak experiences when out of body. So these deep realizations and insights about their life, not in every OBE, but in, in quite a few. And so it might be things like patterns that have been playing out, untrue stories we've believed about ourselves. Mm. Um, they can have resolutions to recurring illnesses. They find out what might be the root cause or what might be influencing it. And they can have epiphanies as well. So I have um, a little sh a little something I'd like to share from one of my case studies. Oh, called sure, yeah. she, oh, she, um, she had a fully conscious, spontaneous um, out-of-body experience, um, which she calls her spiritual awakening. I don't have time to share her whole story. <laughs> Um, but I can tell you some of the insights that she had. So she went to lie on the sofa and she was just completely relaxing and then found herself floating out of her physical body. And she did, didn't try to initiate it. She just found herself floating out. And I want to tell you exactly what she said. I'm just going to have a little look for it very quickly okay. so I can... No problem. So I don't, I don't want to get her words wrong. So I want to tell you what she said without my kind of twist or anything on it, you know? Yeah. Right, let me have a quick look. Haha. <laughs> <laughs> ha. Right. So, so basically she said she knew for every reason why she had devastating physical illnesses. Now she realized that for her entire life, she'd identified with her body and mind, but that her body wasn't really her. She was, is a soul which is infinite. She said, I am not Syra. Syra is just the name for this mind and body. And laughing in the experience, she said to her partner, I am you and you are me. And she said, in that moment, I fully understood the phenomenon of consciousness. Consciousness is an energy shared by all living things. It unifies us and we all exist together in its plane. There is no real separation. So I think when people have a powerful out-of-body experience, so not necessarily if we have a practice, all the ones that we have, um, people can come back with three things. And these are often a lack of fear of death, an increased connection to others in the world around them, and a subtle or significant shift in their life or spirituality. So not everybody but quite a few. Hmm. I think this is why I believe the practice, the out-of-body experience can radically shift our state of consciousness and thus our reality. I'm going to go a little far out here and I'm going to say <laughs> potentially even our physical, objective, waking life reality. I think that can be changed through out-of-body experiences, through the shifting consciousness. And what do you mean by that, I guess, what, um, by the physical? Well, I'm coming to my own belief system here, I will admit. <laughs> <laughs> so I do, I, do, I try not to have a strong belief in any belief system because I think um, we should remain open to what might be possible. But I, I definitely lean towards the, um, the Tibetan Buddhist idea of the reality which we experience now potentially being um, from our own mind. Mm. Uh, so if we can have an out-of-body experience and do some healing or transformation of consciousness through having deep realizations and insights or the activities that we do there, when we come back to our physical body, that change may have occurred in the unconscious mind and then our, our unconscious mind potentially creates our living, waking, everyday reality. 
to that, some yeah. extent. That makes sense. <laughs> I mean, um, that's pretty much the basic idea behind uh, neuroscience as well, you know, like, uh, um, and you're studying psychology, so I'm sure you're well versed in that. Um, that's, that's pretty cool. That's a great story that you shared with, um, with us about, um, that lady's experience and her realization as well. Um, some of the things that I always think about in these experiences, and I know you don't want to go to the darker area of, um, these dream experiences, but, um, that's kind of where I go to typically in my experiences with, uh, working with fear and things like that. And I know, um, you, you talked to me about, um, creating a workshop on, um, facing your fears and I'm, I'm interested to understand how, um, these workshops, you know, like what your perception of this workshop is going to be and how, how you intend to use fear as something that people can work with inside of the lucid or the out of body experiences. Yeah, so I, I, it's, yeah, I'm, so I'm kind of developing a workshop on overcoming fear um, in altered states of awareness. So the altered state of awareness being anything that isn't our everyday, ordinary perception of reality and way of seeing things. For example, now this is my normality, so I'm not in an altered state. Whereas things like dreaming, lucid dreaming, out-of-body experience, plant medicine, psychedelics, even a, an anxiety attack, um, is a, a shifting in consciousness, so an altered state. And when that happens, um, I think we have access to broader things that we have access to with the tiny bit of our 5% of our conscious mind in the waking state. Um, so we have access to 95% of potentially our unconscious mind. Um, but what can happen is that can, that can be a bit scary, it can freak us out, and some of the things that we might see or come into contact with um, might appear scary in those states. So this um, workshop is about uh, techniques we can use. And I'll share one that I think is super important, and it does come from my mindfulness background, um, which is Tara Brack's RAIN technique. And this is, I, I do this automatically now, it's a habit, and if we can get into a habit, again, it falls into um, our everyday life. So the RAIN technique is, say I've come out of my physical body and there's something scary and I don't know what it is. Our initial reaction is to judge what that is, label it, and we label and judge from our unconscious um, cultural conditioning, societal conditioning, religious beliefs, parent beliefs um, that have been imposed onto us, and also our own personal story. Um, and we often interpret something as very scary. But if we can if we can recognize that, okay, I'm here in this space and this is in front of us and this is where I am at the moment. So I'm already starting to respond, not with fear, but I'm just accepting that I'm here in the space. So um, RAIN technique, R, is recognize. So recognize I'm here and just looking around, I'm here in my room, there's something scary. A is accept. So accept not meaning I like what's here, not meaning I endorse what's here, but I accept that it's in this space with me, whatever it might be. So I accept it's here. We can't move forward or make any decisions until we accept that this, this um, whatever it might be is in the room. Um, and then I is investigate. So if we can be, if we can be um, curious over, um, having an anxious response. So the mindfulness teacher Clive, um, Clive Holmes says, uh, fear and curiosity can't exist in the same emotional space. Mm. So if we can shift our anxiety to curiosity and go, oh, well, actually, what is this here? Is it what I think, <laughs> is it what I'm perceiving to be? Um, you know, having curiosity and being able to have a playful response within that curiosity. Still caution if we feel a bit unsafe still, but curiosity. And then N is non-identification. So I might be out of my body. I mean, say I'm in a dark environment and I think there's a dark figure in front of me. I don't go, oh my God, I'm a bad person. I'm labeling things. Oh, I'm in hell. I'm in a deep, dark place and I must be a bad person. So you, N is non-identification. We don't want to self-identify with what's going on. Any interpreting or thinking about what it might be, we can do when we're back in body. Um, but at that point, we've got to have non-identification. Then when you're in that, in that space, 
So recognizing, accepting, investigating, and non-identifying, um, then we can choose a response. Because we can't if we're reacting. If we react and we go, oh my God, this is so scary, I need to get out. <laughs> Resist, resist, avoid, resist, d detach. Um, we're, we're actually, we could even make the situation worse or send ourselves, because our emotion can, to some degree, affect the environment that we're in. It could make it worse. So if we can shift that reaction to response with curiosity and calmness, we can then make a decision about what we want to do. So then it might be, do you know what? I'm just not feeling up to this and courageous enough at the moment to look into what this might be. I'm going to leave the situation, and that's absolutely fine. Maybe it's it's not for us on uh, today, but if we can, we could. You could then try and interact or engage with what it might be. If we feel that we can, if we're still freaking out and we're scared, which we still can be, even after doing all of those things I just said, um, I drop into. Uh, I just drop into a place of love. So. It, Easier said than done when you're in that scary situation. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to give an example of when I did this. I had sleep paralysis, and um, which I've had a few times. And there was a hooded dark figure, and it was moving towards me. And I did exactly what I said, the, uh, the rain technique. Um, and then I was still a bit scared, even though I was calm. But I chose to respond with love. So I dropped, I felt, um, in my mind, I dropped down into my heart space. And I thought of people that I'm grateful for or that I, that I love. So maybe my husband, it could be an animal, it could be a place, anything that can generate love. So that's how we do it, by feeling gratitude. And as soon as I did that, it dissolved the, um, the hallucination or whatever we might think it was, completely dissolved. Hmm. Um, and the environment went neutral. Now, that might not happen every time. That was just my experience then. But I think dropping into love shifts us out of that fear lane into the love lane. And I think sometimes it can directly affect the environment like it did for me. And other times it just puts us in a place where we can respond um, with more clarity in our perception as well. So that's just two techniques. There's, there's lots of different techniques um, that we can do. But... Another idea, which I think might go a bit deeper into what you're asking, is this idea of um, Jung's shadow. So as human beings, we all have a shadow. So these are things about ourselves we disown, we deny, uh, we don't like about ourselves, we don't want to show the world, often related to shame, fear, um, guilt, and we push it all back into our shadow of our con unconscious mind. And it resides there and it has uh, power there to, to a certain extent because we don't want to look at it. Sometimes I think in and out of body experience, elements of, of our own unconscious mind, some people might say these are thought forms in some of the books and things, um, we can come into contact with it and it can manifest in a seemingly personified form. An example of this is I had an out of body experience and when I was on a retreat, an out-of-body experience retreat in France a couple of years ago, and as soon as I came out of my physical body, um, I got scared. There was no reason for me to get scared. And I knew um, that it was self-sabotage because I, 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 <laughs> I worked with a pattern of self-sabotage because um, I know my mind quite well. It's one of my patterns. So I knew it was self-sabotage instantly because it instantly arised and I had this innate knowing and my intuition was this is just self-sabotage. And what happened was I felt a presence behind me. I didn't see it. I wasn't facing that way in my body experience. I felt it instantly arise as soon as I had that intuition and it rushed towards me. And I didn't feel scared because I knew it was self-sabotage manifesting somehow in some sort of way that I could sense. And so I did the drop into love technique where I dropped into my heart space. And I sensed before it before it came to me all the way across the room, got about halfway across, and then it just dissolved and disintegrated and vanished. So I believe that was an aspect of my own unconscious related to my shadow that I was not necessarily able to embrace and integrate in that moment. I kind of just dissolved it. Um, but yeah, I think there are moments like that. William Bullman talks of a great one. I kind of don't want to share it because it sounds scary but he taught very quickly um, he talks of um, 
if I remember rightly, I might get some aspects wrong, so look this up, but he came out of his body and there was this figure, and I think it was sloth-like, and it's very kind of uh, monstery, animal-looking, but kind of human, and it was coming up these stairs, and, and, it, and it faced him, and he was paralyzed with fear, as one would be, <laughs> and it, it came towards him, and it was walking towards him, and he said when it got to him, I think he embraced it. He, he allowed himself to, to, to hold it or have contact with it. There was something about they, it came right up to him. And um, I think it was the same thing. I think it transformed, it completely dissolved. And he talked about how that was really powerful for him. Um, but that's a, another good example of these aspects that seem very solid and very separate and very scary. Uh, but actually could be maybe related to us in some way. And that's quite difficult to comprehend because we don't want to look at those <laughs> dark places ourselves. Who does, right? <laughs> right, yeah. No, th th those are great techniques that you shared. And um, thank you for making them so clear and like evident of what actually to do. And um, I've used many of those techniques without kind of using um, those names. I didn't know they were called something that somebody had kind of made um but i was taught by a buddhist teacher as well to kind of accept these experiences and and show love and grace towards them versus uh um trying to attack them or be fearful um the attacking one worked um better than the fearful one do did but it, it definitely was a lot more progressive when i uh, accepted them instead of trying to scare them away or something like that so the, the great techniques really um blown away by how you you stated them they're very clear so thank you oh no worries i hope they come in useful for for people definitely um yeah i'll be sharing those uh with people that i know that have sleep paralysis and things like that um with with lucid dreaming and out of body experiences it's, i think it's important to discuss like the um the dangers involved with them or the experiences um i'm wondering if if you perceive any um, people that should be cautious of practicing them or um, or trying to have these experiences, maybe trying too hard, things like that. I'm, I'm wondering if you came across anybody like that in your past or if you've come to the point where you're, you had to take a break. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought that question up, actually, because I think it's an important one to ask. Um, kind of three things. The first is, yeah, I don't let anybody that might be in psychosis, so may have any kind of me uh, deep mental health issues, take part in the workshops, um, the out-body experience workshops anyway. Lucid dreaming, I think, is sl slightly different, and I'll come to that in a moment. But if we are to explore the deeper dimensions of our own mind and also a potential greater reality, it's I think it's important that we have a strong, stable sense of who we are and our self-identity. And the reason why I say that is because if we do have a transformative experience, a powerful experience, or a, or a big realization about ourselves and who we are, that can break down our psychological scaffolding to a degree. Um, so what might happen is some people can have a spiritual crisis or a spiritual emergency after a deep experience. And th this goes for any spiritual experience, really, a lucid dream, an out-body experience, uh, plant medicine. And what can happen is if they can't, if they don't have the ability to integrate what they've realized about themselves or the world, they can go into a period of, of depression and self-questioning and wondering about life and if they already don't have a strong sense of self in order for that to be broken down or in some cases shattered if it's um if they've had like an experience of the void um which is a, a, a we'll talk about that later we won't go into that now <laughs> then uh, then it can yeah it can, they can go into a period of depression and dr um Steve Taylor writes a lot of books about this, um, about spiritual emergency and spiritual crisis. One is called The Leap uh, by Hay House, and that's really good, and it talks about this. 
Um, so I think some people can have that. Uh, it's what's called um, a nadir experience. So you might have heard of peak experience where people have these experiences beyond their sense of self that are profound and beautiful and moving and oneness and interconnectedness. A nadir experience is almost the opposite, but not quite. It's where we can have something that's so profound that it, it as I said before, it breaks down our psychological scaffolding, especially if a person has very rigid beliefs about themselves or the world, and then those beliefs get obliterated through something that they experience, yeah. um, then they might go into uh, a spiritual crisis. But even then, I think it's Stanislav Grof, he says, even going through a spiritual crisis or an Adir experience, people tend to come out of it positively because there's a rebirth. So there's a breakdown and then there's a rebirth where they kind of rebuild their sense of self. And that's why when people have a powerful spiritual experience, they might change career. They might suddenly um, become, sounds a bit cliche, but a yoga yeah. teacher. You hear a lot of people in the corporate world having a profound experience and then suddenly becoming a meditation teacher or a yoga teacher. And I don't know if they've had a spiritual crisis, but they might have had that breakdown and then rebirth and their sense of self has changed and then their outward outward world doesn't reflect um who they are anymore mm. so then they they have that change that makes sense um you mentioned the void so uh, we're getting close to um running out of time here so i wanted to touch base on that i mean um you said you wanted to talk about later so i, I definitely want to bring that up what is the void and um, how does that relate to out-of-body experiences and lucid dreams? Well, to be honest, that just popped into my head as it came <laughs> up with dream theory. I haven't actually experienced the void and out-of-body experience. I've experienced it in a lucid dream and only once and for a very short amount of time. But I can talk more about other people, that, especially my husband, who's a lucid dreaming teacher, um, what he um, his experience of it. And... So the void is a place where there's kind of no projects, no projections. There is, um, there's, there's almost nothing, nothingness. But in that nothingness, there's everythingness because there's nothing that's made yet. So as Luigi Skyam Rebella said from the Monroe Institute um, a few days ago, I was with him. He said it's a place of pure potentiality. So it can be scary because there isn't. There may not even be a self to be aware of a self. It's just beingness. It's just full awareness and presentness, um, which most of us can't relate to that unless we've had maybe a, a, a brief awakening experience. Mm. Uh, but it seems to be a place where things are yet to come into being. Um, I mean, you know, that's really kind of one of the aims of, um, you know, having that experience is maybe one of the aims of the enlightening experience. You know, not. Yeah, I'm not qualified to talk about <laughs> it, so I'm not going to go on because that's really out of my depth. I'm not qualified to talk about that whatsoever. It'd be better to ask, you know, your teacher for those sorts of things. But no. that's what it seems to be from my um, from my little experience and from what other people have said. Oh, okay. So, it, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so what's in the future for you and um with your your teaching and um, your experiences? Where, where are you going with this, do you think? Um, well, currently, I'm, I want to everybody to hopefully, in some way, if they feel called to and ready to, connect with themselves. And that sounds so simple when it comes out like that. But I suppose... It's just another avenue, our body experience is, a, is another potential avenue in order to get to know ourselves and remember who we really are. Because I think it's like the idea of um, the diamond in the stone, particularly with the mind. I feel like we as humans have this ultimate absolute potential and infinity and power that we, we just can't really, at least for me, can't really grasp or tap into maybe in some moments um well, i can but i feel like knowing about different levels of reality and our our what's going on behind our known senses our five senses because there is something going on there when we start to tap into and and 
kind of dip our toe in the water of all these possibilities, it really widens our awareness and widens our perception. Um, when our perception widens, more possibilities come to us and we're able to connect more deeply with life, ourself and others. And that's an ongoing process and by no means easy. But I think that most of the world doesn't know about it. They don't know or haven't had that experience. Um, and I think our body experience can be a profound way of, of accessing that and having that realization. Hmm. So I kind of went off on one then, but <laughs> uh, it basically, basically I'm doing some workshops and I want to find out how I can best tailor the workshops to allow people and let people have these experiences should they wish to start practice. But also I'm doing a documentary because like I said, I just don't think people know about it, to be honest, or if they do, they think it's a near death experience or it's related to mental health, like something's wrong. Um, so I'm doing a documentary that is to spread awareness that this is a natural human phenomena. It happens. It happens across cultures all over the world. It's been a practice in many cultures for thousands of years. And it's, it's quite normal and we can talk about that. And I don't want there to be stigma for people to talk about that either. So I'm doing a documentary that's interviewing ordinary people having profound experiences in their out of body journeys. And I'm looking at, I'm interviewing some experts as well. So hopefully that will come out in April oh, wow. or May. Yeah. yeah, it's only short. It's only gonna be a short 25 minute um, documentary. But yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. Beyond that, I do wanna, I do wanna write a book and I uh, kind of getting a little bit of a skeleton and a structure together, but I want it to allow it to unfold organically and, and see what happens as my journey unfolds, how, how the book might unfold and who that might be beneficial for. Well, great. Um, <laughs> what are some ways that people can get a hold of you and um, read your information and uh, take part in your, one of your classes uh, online? Yeah, so it's uh, jadeshaw.com is the website, but I don't really update my website. It's just got all the general information there. I'm on social media quite a lot. So Facebook, uh, Jade Shaw, Walk Between Worlds. Just type in Jade Shaw, Astral Projection or Outer Body Experience. Or Instagram, I share free tips and tools every week on how to have an outer body experience and general information about them. So that's Jade underscore Shaw underscore Move underscore Beyond. <laughs> okay. I'll yeah. make sure to put the links in there so people can um, get an okay. easy connect that way as well. Well, Jade, yeah. um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say thank you for having me. Yeah. I hope what I've said has been useful and insightful and people know that it's not scary. Oh, <laughs> and I want to add one more thing. So the practice isn't about escaping life or evading the body. It's about bringing back the wisdom and the insights that we have in our journeys and being able to embody them and integrate them into our everyday lives. It's great. Yeah. Um, I think that's missed by a lot of people. They're trying to kind of expand their consciousness versus expand and then bring back and integrate. So you, you have a very, um, great message. I've talked to a lot of people, um, about these experiences and interviewed a lot of people. Um, but you're, I have to say that your, um, how you speak your words and, and talk about the experience and what you're trying to do is very clean and clear. So, um, I appreciate that. And thank you for spending your time uh, to come onto the show and speak to people about your experiences and other people's experiences and how uh, you're helping people to understand and integrate these experiences in their life. So thanks. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. This has been another episode of the Cosmic Echo, a Taylor podcast. If you enjoyed this episode of Cosmic Echo and would like to learn more about Jay Shaw and her work, you can visit our website at tailleaders.com backslash CE podcast, and there you can click on links that will take you to her work, as well as ways to contact her. Additionally, you can support this podcast through the donation page, which is located at the same website. We look forward to bringing you additional episodes in the near future, but until then, happy dreaming. <laughs>